extremely positive in seeing the changes we're seeing now in, in the sort of um, political terrain of thinking now for the long term in terms of an investing on investment you know, in our people and in, in those sectors. However, I am extremely concerned about the cost and how that is going to be sort of afforded if I can put it that way. Um, I, I think, from my perspective, um, I, I would say uh, there are two hundred things to, to the subject as to whether uh, the change is sustainable. And I think to answer that, we must look at the source of the change, and that gives you a sense as to the sustainability. Uh, three things struck me. One was um, the policy of human resources that is available in the country. And uh, it was certainly very different from what I had expected. I could hire the same quality of people that I could have hired at Goldman Sachs or at UBS or JP Morgan when I worked in Fort Clinton to do this. And so that gave me a lot of comfort in this business. I think that there's so much talk about natural resources, but the reality is that sustainable change can only be done by high quality human resources. And I think that is the first thing that gave me a lot of comfort that the change be sustainable. And you've seen that in industries that went very significant 10 years ago. You've seen that in entertainment. You've seen that in technology. You've seen that in real estate. You've seen that in the financial services sector. We didn't have a developed private equity sector 20 years ago until Africa Capital Line is like we are employing you and now we have a really sophisticated financial services sector. That I think is the first thing that tells me that we change sustainable quality of human resources. Countries that have been successful, Singapore doesn't have any, you know, any natural resources. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan had not any natural resources, but it's all about human resources. The second thing is the efficiency of the financial services sector is improving. Now, Professor Kolya made a presentation about you know, uh, as we move from the construction phase to the operating phase, we need to get the participation of pension funds in the market now. 20 years ago, my understanding of pension market in Nigeria was pensioners lining up and collapsing, trying to collect their pensions. Today, we're talking about a much more sophisticated pension system that is actually now moving from a, a softness level of, of paying people the pensions to actually become an active participant in the investment process. Why is that important? Look, it's the real sector, in my opinion, that drives the size of the capital market in the participation of the pension market as well as the insurance market. We must still find a way to make those uh, uh, much more efficient in this participation in the financial services sector. The third thing is obviously, the debate we're having today is about how we improve infrastructure, bring private participation in infrastructure. I also think that you know, that is one thing that I've done a lot of over time. One concern I will raise about this is that in the next 10 years, we're going to have 40 million people join the workforce. 40 million people join the workforce. The average age of the Nigerian is 17 and a half. That's a lot of young people that we need to try and make sure we keep in a productive system. Otherwise, this will turn from a strength to a source of threat to the sustainability of the change. But overall, I intend to adopt the last half full approach to the view of the change. I'll take over, I'll take my cue from what the last speaker said about the glass being half full. Um, I think in Nigeria we're almost fortunate to have arrived at a point where there's a clear case for change. Um, consultants talk about having the need, uh, having a burning platform, and I think if there ever was a burning platform, now is the time. So there's a very clearly established need and urgency for change. I think one of the key challenges we're going to have in terms of making this change sustainable is ensuring, first of all, that we manage expectations. And maybe because like, I represent the manufacturing sector and cement in particular, we're used to taking a really long-term view. Um, Lafarge has been in Nigeria for over 50 years in one form or another, and we're looking forward to another 50 plus years. So we need to be able to manage expectations. And with any change process, um, leadership is important. And the steps you take in actually implementing that change are extremely important. My view is that all the wonderful visions and strategies have already been articulated. What will make the difference and what will make this change sustainable is basically implementation. And you do it through releasing the power of the private sector. Um, the national, the NNBC clearly has to become much more commercialized. 
uh, at the moment, we can't afford this kind of budget of course. Uh, we have, I think, we have seen uh, emission production and emission reserves. Always. All these ideas are our uh, priorities because we're investing in that. And thank you for the same things that's always And uh, the other thing, of course, seeing the same thing uh, in the gas sector. The gas sector will be this power, the power of the technology, and the bit of the explosion of the energy network. Again, we're also doing the bio wind cell uh, approach to the gas pricing and the gas processing. We'll see, again, a real, real release in that sector. And with that infrastructure, we'll see gas getting to the north. And hopefully, we can see the logistics and the review of the in the north. So, really, uh, what we are expecting is a no of the government that has been elected on a change mandate, so it doesn't really have any real reason to defend any kind of legacy. It can change the way things are done. Most of the ideas are already out there. Most of them are based on released in the private commercial sector. And we can actually see this in the public system. I don't know what transition like fossil has told us. That will not be in the there's going to be an interim process of getting out of where we are. Even if we have the right policies and we have the right things we want to do, to move from where we are right now to where we are talking about having a productive environment, there will be a period that we're still going to go through that balance. And for me, the banking industry has a lot to do. We have 46% of our population not banking at all. So that's huge potential there. We have opportunities to grow in many sectors in supporting all the things we are talking about. And everybody's revenue in this room. The sales proceeds, whatever you want to do, the transportation, will still pass through the system. So I see a lot of potentials for growth, but I am cautious to say that for the first 12 to 18 months, we'll see it balancing out, as you see in the start this today. We will not be excitedly looking for things to transform like this. Overnight, over the next one, two months, I will see that where we are coming from, the impact of the international price of oil will on it was very bad. And we are prepared because a number of our customers and businesses, individuals, facilities based on last year's conditions. So we're going to have a very tight squeeze between the last quarter and the first quarter of next year. And you see where we need to work hard to ensure that we don't encourage more deals, more dollars. So for us, it's a very, very Difficult period. Regulators, the banks, our customers need to work in tandem to see how we go way through the next 12, 18 months so that we can launch ourselves into what will take us to be better year four, year five, and the next five years. What changed? One, the good partnership between the federal government and the private sector, underlined by a very strong regulatory framework and a very transparent system. Transparency is very key in public sector and private sector partners. There's no transparency, that is going to work. The second thing we just help us in the industry, and uh, Professor Paul referred to, is about scale advantage. As we speak now, all the big telcos, we are working together for a general across passive infrastructure. Things like generator, like the towers, like shelters. We found that we have a very special complexity around the anybody. They are basically their assets. That once it's on the ground, it's on the ground. So we begin to share the very scale advantages. And the next level is even how we we'll start sharing the active infrastructure. Active infrastructure is what brings the telephone services to you. We're in discussion already. How do we begin to enjoy the scale opportunity of sharing active infrastructure? And also looking at the vendor phase, the suppliers, all the same suppliers, all the same vendors work for the power force. So created a good ecosystem of suppliers, good ecosystem of partners in the various chain, and more importantly, the cost structure that makes it easy for us to absorb any shock in our cost. In the last time you feel much that a massive 20% distribution of currency would not pass the increase into the customer. Rather than really, even though I price because of intense competition from all the three of us. So it's good for everybody. Good for the market, good for the government. Uh, if, um, if mobile phones that uh, seem the monopoly of Nitel, do you think there'll be 130 million subscriptions in, uh, in Nigeria now? Probably not. It was fortunate that mobile phones were, they were the perfect technological innovation. They could classify as a new product, and so the outside Nitel was mid. Um, and they were a technology which was very cheap, 
can spread widely. You know, some future technologies are, are going to be um, uh, potentially more scary. I mean, think of the, um, over the next 10 years, driverless cars will come in, uh, in, into uh, America and, and Europe and uh, East Asia. Um, the technology of driverless cars um, is a much more expensive technology requires the government to do a lot more. Um, but it's uh, potentially a game changer. Traffic jams are sort of can be a thing that will pass. So that's the sort of technology where um, getting, I go back to cities, getting an effective city is kind of a race against time. Um, you need to get your cities up to, up to speed so that when the new technologies come in, um, they're not so far behind that they can actually adopt these new technologies. Um, so, Mobile phones are wonderful technology, but future technologies won't always be as friendly as that. I just wanted to reiterate finally that your analysis of the public transition, I think, was exactly right. That you've got a sort of a short term bumpy uh, down, uh, which is the necessary uh, path towards a much more, a much more uh, prosperous long term. And managing that bumpy path. Fortunately, the banks are in pretty good shape to do it. Certainly, uh, this democratic and peaceful uh, transition um, uh, was necessary, um, but it's not, it's not sufficient. It remains to be seen um, what the next administration will be able to, to deliver. Um, and, um, and, and in that respect, I think what we are expecting with the new administration is that we hope uh, to continue the way of reforms and I would say modernization of not, not only the economy but the whole society uh, and to be really um, to find a place for Nigeria in, in, in a globalized uh, world and it's not an easy uh, thing to do. Um, what we do as, as the EU and again I, I want to, to clarify uh, I'm on the head of the EU but that there are 20 other European ambassadors <laughs> in Abuja uh, so, um, I would say Nigeria is a, is a big diplomatic uh, European hub uh, with, with 20 ambassadors in Abuja and about 10 um, uh, representations in, in Lagos. So, Nigeria can become one of the top 10 strategic partners of Europe. It is already, but we want to, to do it more and, and to be more practical and to implement more. Um, more uh, positive actions together with Nigeria. One thing we are already doing that we would like to develop is really to, to, um, to have this uh, strategic dialogue with Nigeria, for instance, in New York. Nigeria is uh, a member of the Security Council. We would like, with Nigeria, to build alliances. Nigeria can represent the African voice together with the two or three other African members um, in the Security Council and work with them on global issues. The same in Addis. We would like to see Nigeria more involved in the work of the African Union. You know how Nigeria was at the basis of the creation of the, of the, of the renewal, the, the renewed uh, uh, African Union, um, and, and we would like to, to work with, with, uh, with Nigeria on, on those continental issues, even more so at regional level. The ECOWAS, we would like to see Nigeria much more active in ECOWAS on the political front, on the economic front. I hear um, that Nigeria is a wonderful market with uh, more than 170 million people. Well, just double the numbers. Just consider West Africa as, as a real market, right? And being ourselves the end product of a regional integration process, we can show the benefits of, of regional integration at political and economic level. And I, I would say if there is something we would like to see is certainly a better or a more developed collaboration of Nigeria with the direct neighbors, not only West Africa, but also Cameroon and Chad, if only for to fix the uh, insecurity um, problems. So um, another point I, I, I like to make is that I don't think Nigeria needs foreign aid, foreign budget. I think Nigeria is rich enough. What Nigeria needs probably is uh, transfer of technology, uh, advice, technical assistance and private investment.